little bananas, little baby bananas. I study the interactions between humans and tigers and Chitwan Nepal. Success to me is identifying the conditions where I think would allow people and tigers to coexist into the long-term future. Not only do they live side by side, but they actually, people will walk into the forest um, to collect various things for their households and actually will walk in the same places that tigers frequently walk. People there really depend on the local forest. They, it, they're a subsistence culture. And so it's important that the forest stay healthy. And so we, we wanna try to uh, let people understand that having tigers there is important to keep the, the forest healthy. It keeps the number of deer and boar down a little bit because deer and boar often will eat people's crops, which is probably even more detrimental to their livelihoods than, than tigers are. They do sometimes rarely eat people, um, and they do also sometimes eat uh, people's livestock. So that is a concern, and tiger conservation is, is mitigating those type of risks uh, on people from tigers. It's very rare to see a tiger, and that's, that's part of what they are. That's part of why they're so um, part of people's culture, is this sort of mysticism. I mean, you know they're there. They're a big animal, um, and you'll, you'll see all kinds of signs. You'll see their paw prints. You'll see their scat. You'll see, um, you'll see all kinds of things, scratch marks on trees, but you won't see a tiger. And even all the months that I've been in Nepal, I've seen a tiger twice. When people usually think of Nepal, they think of Mount Everest, they think of the Himalayas. Actually, Chitwan is in the, the flat area of Nepal. It's right at the, the very base of the Himalayas. So it's a really rich, fertile area. So it's a huge agricultural uh, activity there. And so it's, it's basically a collection of villages. There are some kind of medium-sized cities in Chitwan, but basically it's an agricultural rural area. It's interesting to me that you can have an animal that's so charismatic that people respond to viscerally, yet that are still endangered and are still declining. This seems to be this, um, this disparity in the way we value this animal, but our kind of inability to protect them. And so that to me presented a challenge. There was a charisma, but now it's, it's sort of become the challenge of, well, let's take this animal that everybody values and respects and really try to uh, buckle down and, and improve conservation for tigers. They're very symbolic and, and people have, like I said, have lived next to tigers for um, as, far, as far back as they can remember. And so kind of letting people understand that protecting them is protecting their heritage. Even here in the U.S., there's a lot of talk about how do we coexist with things like wolves? How do we coexist with um, animals like grizzlies that do uh, present a risk to people but, but also are valued a great deal by people? When people talk about conserving tigers, they don't conserve one, they conserve a population of them. And they want to conserve the species, and that really means protecting whole ecosystems, whole large tracts of land that protect not just the tigers, but um, elephants and rhinos and deer and boar and reptiles and alligators and insects and all the plants and everything that live in that ecosystem. So it's really kind of a big task because you're not just protecting tigers. That's sort of the animal that we use to focus the energy and money, but it's, but it's about protecting our environment and our ecosystems that tigers live in. So that's kind of the way I think of it. It's really a challenge, but it's the reward can be potentially huge if you can be successful.